Open channels of communication during program implementation enabled us and our partners to reassess goals or processes before those challenges became insurmountable. And flexibility and creativity allowed us to make changes in real time when fluid conditions presented unforeseen obstacles. Developing strategies that were relevant to the needs of our constituencies would have been impossible without a formal process of consultative meetings about the Foundation's thematic issues with a range of stakeholders before formalizing our policies and our guidelines. In addition to informing staff about critical community-based realities, they also identified areas where the Foundation could add value to the work of other donors, and avoid duplication, and, be and identify best practices that could be modified and replicated across communities and beyond national borders. The most important outcome, though, of the cons consultative forums and ongoing dialogue of our partners was a clear understanding at the onset of our operations that strengthening institutional capacity should become an integral part of our funding strategy. This was not something that we had thought of very much before we started to move around in our community. In some cases, capacity building support was prioritized over program funding until an institution was in a position to effectively implement a program. That, it's an interesting situation because one would say why, would ask why you would fund an organization to implement a program knowing that they're not as strong as they should be. But in the community-based work that we were engaged in, those people and those organizations were the ones who had the legitimacy in their communities. So supporting them, even if that took longer and it was a more protracted process, was far more important than supporting another institution that would not be able to get the buy-in from the community that these organizations could. This support was as fundamental as providing computer equipment and covering the cost of internet access and telephone service for a two-year period of time, or as groundbreaking as providing solar panels to reduce partners' exorbitant expenses for alternative power supplies. Ironically, um, at the Harlem School of the Arts, as we are replacing the roof, um, the, uh, the discussion of green roofs came about, and I th it really brought me back to the solar power um, work that we, and the solar power services that we have provide to our grantee, provided to our grantees in West Africa. And um, that was the direction I was hoping that we would be able to move in in the future. As a short-term funder, though, at Soros, our relationship with our grantees lasted an average of two years. We did, not, we did work with some to identify the means to generate revenue. However, this approach was irrelevant for most of our partners because they served constituents with no sources of income. In those cases, we concentrated on building their capacity and producing successful program outcomes with the hope that they would then become more attractive to other donors, and we played a key role in making connections to prospective supporters. One of our great successes was, was supporting the establishment of over 30 community-based radio stations in countries emerging from conflict within a two-year period of time. With these stations, we worked to create a culture of advertising, so that was a good one, in communities with extremely limited resources. I can't remember whose great idea that was. And <laughs> But it was it was good, and we started with the events in the lives of their of their of the members of those communities that had the most significance, which turned out to be birth and death. In cultures where births and deaths are celebrated, and extended families are large, there's a market there for community radio. <laughs> there really is, and we found out that announcements about both births and deaths are made up via every form of mass communication available, and that's a very highfalutin term for posters and on, you know, hammered into trees and flyers and word of mouth. I am proud to announce that birth and death announcement advertising is the single largest source of revenue for community-based radio stations in Sierra Leone. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> And I understand that this successful outcome is being replicated today in Liberia. Other projects to which we applied the same proactive techniques were the establishment of legal aid clinics throughout West Africa to represent women in Islamic and customary courts, supporting the establishment of truth commissions in Ghana and Sierra Leone, and training and employment in new technologies for the disabled and people living with AIDS. If you, get a, if you feel a theme there, yes, it's, it's finding a way to, support, help, to help people support themselves and uh, giving them the tools to be able to do that. So 
uh, and also uh, seeking redress for the, for the crimes of the past. After returning to the United States, I had the opportunity to experience the relationship between a donor and a community-based institution from the other side when I joined the Harlem School of the Arts, one of Harlem's most treasured arts education institutions, and we can't repeat that often enough. It did not take much time to realize that the issues challenging my West African partners were woven into the daily fabric of this arts organization. Shortly after my arrival, a former colleague remarked upon what he thought was my unusual career choice in relation to my past experience in the international arena. I drew his attention to the parallels between the two worlds. Marginalized communities with limited access to basic services. Competition amongst community-based organizations for extremely finite resources. Constituencies and communities impacted adversely by external factors over which they have little to no control. And most importantly, children whose future is determined by the ability of adults to keep them in, alive, and in this case, out of prison, and those children's access to education as the sole route out of poverty. The transformation that had occurred in Harlem, like so many other communities nationwide that you are very, very well aware of and a part of, and that were driven by gentrification, real estate development, and other political and economic factors, was demographically, architecturally, and economically stark. Yet, as I sought the trustees and staff's views when I joined about the community that we served, it became clear that theirs was a perception of service to the community of the past and not that of the present and the foreseeable future that was walking outside right in front of the building that we were working in. And it became um, an odyssey for me to really uh, get my colleagues to understand that our future was absolutely impossible to guarantee without being becoming a more inclusionary institution um, and without inviting the new members of our community into that institution because many of them had the resources to actually pay for services and by having more who paid for services we were able to provide more to those who couldn't this is a as, as those many of you know this is a, a very challenging uh, issue in Harlem and many other communities where gentrification has seen, has brought about a racial transformation in those communities. Um, but we became a more diverse staff and we became a more diverse community. And what made us community was the fact that we shared certain just inalienable truths, which was our love for children, our love for everyone's children, and our strong belief that exposing our children to the arts and, by, and that supporting the artists in our communities and that making those connections between art and life made us a better institution, made us a better community, made us better neighbors, and the list goes on. This experience I learned was common among peers at other community-based arts organizations, many of which shared a similar history and present day reality as institutions that have become more insular as the world surrounding them has undergone radical transformation since their inception. Founded by dynamic individuals like Dorothy Maynor, who my mother has in her autograph book from her when she was 12 years old, her, as her signature, she's so proud. <laughs> she is so proud that I worked there. And as phenomenal, they were founded by dynamic individuals, many of whom had crossed the color line as phenomenally successful artists in their own right. These visionaries' legacy was to ensure that future generations of artists were nurtured and trained within their own communities. And while the founders' mission-driven goals may have been attained, it is the underdevelopment and the, it, it's the underdeveloped institutional capacity that challenges arts administrators and donors and threatens the organization's survival today. As the director of a community-based arts organization, I had numerous discussions with donors about modifying the institution's business model and many other interesting ideas, but very few engaged in a dialogue with me about the institution's operational capacity. Not, not because I didn't try. 